Morning City Lifers, both here in the building and those of you online, so good to be with you. Uh, thanks to Kay and the coordinators. I don't know what's the right. <laughs> Lucky to have the A-team on stage this morning, by the way. Did you see that? Alex and Ansler on stage together for the first time in, that must be years, right? Yeah, a couple of years uh, from the from the techie team in the lounge lockdown uh, prior to that was probably the last time they were on uh, stage worshiping together. So that was cool to see. Uh, Matt P was telling me they've started a new band. It's called Books, which is quite lacquer. Apparently that's so no one will judge them by their covers. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you're going to get some dad jokes this morning. <laughs> Oh, brother. Okay. You guys are warming up still. That's fine. It's a cold day here in Derbs. Uh, for those of you that are connecting from far away, uh, so the, the peeps are still warming up a bit, but that's cool. Welcome, by the way, if you are joining us online. In fact, what will be quite lacquer is if you can know that you are in the room here with us. I'll send you a morning, you lacquer bunch message on Facebook there while we uh, are busy with the meeting. You actually are with us. So yeah, we just want to welcome you. You know, there's a couple families that have connected uh, online this morning. And yeah, as Marcel said, greetings from Donnie and Ronell um, down at Lighthouse today with our friends um, in the city. I think that's awesome that they can spend uh, time down there. And yeah, just from my side, always, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. I, <laughs> I learn heaps when preparing to share a message um, like this. So it actually is a wonderful privilege, not just to be able to share, but to go through the prep time um, and just hearing from God and studying and getting input from others to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying uh, for this morning. So Donnie did touch on wine and wine skins uh, last week. If you didn't catch that preach, you can catch it online. Um, really worthwhile taking a listen to that. And um, I've been studying just on one of Jesus' most simple miracles, and I'd love for us, as we always do this morning, and as we've done so well in our time of singing and praising and worshiping Him, is just fixing our eyes on Jesus this morning. We prayed about it outside this morning before we all got together. We want to continuously make Jesus the center of our attention, um, and it's scriptural as well. I don't know if you've got a first slide there or who's Leal, are you controlling the deck? There you go. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 verse 2 is where this quote comes from. It says, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Or like this quote says, fix your eyes on Jesus. It's okay to stare. I think that's quite cool. So we can do that this morning. And we're going to be speaking together just from... John chapter 2. So if you're going to follow along in a Bible or a tablet or a phone or anything like that, I will put the scriptures up as well. But we're going to be in John chapter 2. And maybe I can ask you just as we do start to do something a little different now at the beginning of the meeting, whether you're here in the building, whether you're connecting with us online this morning. Uh, can I maybe ask you, I'm going to read the whole passage. It's not long. It's a couple verses. Um, but just to close your eyes rather than following on for a moment. We'll get back to focusing with our eyes, but for now, just close your eyes. You can do it right now. And maybe just go ahead and picture yourself at a wedding banquet. Not a wedding reception like we have now, but way back, like 2,000 years ago, we had a wedding banquet. And try to imagine the truths of this story as I as I read to you. Lord, we do pray, even as Marcel prayed earlier, Lord, we pray that the truth of your word would just come alive as we study it, as we look at it, as we read it. Will you open our spiritual eyes this morning just to hear from you and to understand what you are saying? John chapter 2. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. So we're at the celebration, and the wedding's going on, and there's a party, and there's a meal, and verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Verse 4, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, 
My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each of them holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And he called upon the bridegroom, took him aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. And what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. You can open your eyes. Nick, there's like a very white, very bassy wallow on this mic, and I'm having to hold it far away so that it doesn't pop and bang as I speak into it. But right now, you're making some adjustments so that it comes right, and yet nothing seems to be changing. <laughs> I know Nick will get to it. That's fine. So what an amazing moment, right? You can imagine, you can picture just being there. You just did that, I hope. As we were reading those few words, uh, Jesus is at a wedding. What's amazing to read about it, as we just did, is that it's an unnamed family in Cana of Galilee. It was a pretty obscure place in a fairly obscure province or area. You can put up a pic of Cana in Galilee there, Lille. This is, I mean, it's color, so, and there's a rainbow. So it's probably a pic that's fairly recent uh, of what it looks like today. Not exactly a bustling metropolis of Cana. Uh, so you can imagine what it looked like 2,000 years ago, if that's what it looks like in its 2,000 years later developed state. Um, bottom line, it was a fairly ordinary wedding in a fairly ordinary place for an unmentioned couple. We don't even know who the couple was that is spoken of here in John chapter 2. And it sounds like actually the perfect place for Jesus' first miracle, right? Here's the king of heaven who was born in a manger, in a stable, and who's going to die a death on a cross for all of us. And importantly, Jesus is there along with his disciples, it says, right? We read that now. And maybe with a few other people who didn't RSVP. I don't know. How many of you know if you've ever planned or been involved in or been part of maybe your own wedding or another wedding, usually something goes wrong. Maybe people notice Maybe only the bride or groom know that the plan that eventually ended up happening is different to what was originally planned, but something often goes wrong when you try and plan an event like a wedding. A few nods around the room. Okay, so some of you have experienced that. Um, you, you can send out the invites. You can hope that everyone RSVPs. You can carefully cater for each person at a beautiful wedding reception like the one that Leo's going to show you now. And then what can happen is a bunch of extra heads maybe can show up unannounced. And Nick, this mic is still popping a bit. Maybe it's just too loud, bro. You can actually drop the volume. So I've actually been in a situation as emceeing a wedding a few years back. Um, each of the people at the wedding had a named spot at the table, you know, the, the, where the tables have been like carefully planned out. Um, so that you don't put so-and-so next to, I don't know, crazy Uncle Craig. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Craig. <laughs> and they've been extra careful, right? They've actually phoned guests in advance who haven't RSVP'd yet to double-check, like you didn't say you're coming or not coming, 
are you coming? No, I'm not coming. Sorry. Okay, cool. So they've checked and double checked and given opportunity. And uh, yeah, so on the day with everything happening between the formal part of the ceremony and the reception, you know, there's normally photos or what, what, and then everyone's waiting for the bride and groom to arrive. And there's chaos because the tables are being reorganized and reset and the bride is in anguish and the groom doesn't know what's going on. Often the case, ladies. <laughs> so I'm ready to start the reception. I'm ready to call in the couple of the moments um, of the hour and we can't find them anywhere. So I go to look for them and the bride is in tears, literally in frustration, anger. She's, you know, the groom doesn't know how to console. It's chaos. She's saying, tell them to go home. He's saying, but they're my friends. <laughs> and Mesh will remember that day. Remember that day, man? Yeah. Weddings can be stressful. I offered to go and tell the people, sorry, we didn't cater for you to eat. It was lovely that you could be here today, but you actually need to leave now. And eventually they made place for them and settled down. But back here in John chapter 2, maybe this wedding that Jesus and his disciples are at is no different, right? There's a small crisis that seems to be developing. And here's our title slide this morning to quote Jesus' mother, Mary. They have no more wine. I mean, it can easily happen at a wedding. Catering can go wrong, maybe because someone counted wrong or someone planned wrong or there were a few more, you know, thirsty okies than what you maybe planned for at the wedding. And so now... You're running out of stuff. Maybe people who never RSVP'd showed up. Either way, in this story, we know the wine has run out. So what? The wine's going to run out. Well, apparently so quite a lot, actually, because Jesus' mother, Mary, cared deeply about the situation. Why? Clearly her friends were about to be embarrassed. In fact, she cares enough to take the matter straight to Jesus. As we look at the, the scriptures there in verse 3, Leo, when the wine was gone, Jesus's mother said to him, they have no more wine. Son, crisis. The wine has run out. There's no more wine. And we can so easily skip over a simple little exchange like that. But please Maybe just allow me a few moments because I just sat and thought the other day in my devotions when I was reading this, like it's pretty significant that Mary even thought to ask Jesus to help. I mean, if we think of the timeline of Jesus' life up until that point as recorded in the Gospels, there's a pretty big gap between Jesus being age 12 and being in Jerusalem, and he's speaking in the temple, and the family leaves him behind. You know the story, right? They head home. They've traveled a day. They can't find Jesus. They go back. They find him in the temple, and everyone's just in awe of what he's sharing at such a young age. And then there's this gap, and then we hear of Jesus being baptized and entering into his ministry, and we kind of find ourselves here at his first miracle, probably around age 30, right, if the records show. So 18-year gap. What happened in those 18 years? What happened in Mary and Joseph's home during that time between age 12 and age 30 that causes her to go, there's a problem, let's ask Jesus for help. It's lucky to have Matty home. Are you Matt? Good boy. Yesterday, he asked me, Dad, can I eat the cake in the fridge? I said to him, sure, but eating it at the dining room table would probably be more comfortable. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> anyway, Maddie, I didn't say that, Matt. That never happened. That's just another dad joke. Maddie loves to watch Marvel movies, like lots of kids his age. And yeah, I really enjoy them as well now that he's gotten us into them and we watch them and, you know. Uh, take a look. So I blame Matt for this next part, but my brain goes, you know, you watch some of these characters like Spider-Man, right? Figuring out that he can, he's got a web and he can attach himself to stuff. And, you know, the auntie drops something and his web 
catches it and then is like, oh my word, did that just happen? And she's like, what just happened? And they begin to figure out some weird stuff is happening here. And I know it's a stupid analogy and it's probably nothing, nothing, nothing at all like what happened in Jesus's life. But if you think about it, like imagine yourself in Mary and Joseph's home and Mary's cooking up a storm and she calls on Jesus, young Jesus, hey, yes, you know, we've run out of oil. Can you run down to the shop and grab us some? And with a playful, playful smile, he kind of turns to her and says, try pouring again, mom. <laughs> and so she pours again and the oil flows. I don't know. It's possible. It's plausible, right? I'm filling in some stuff that doesn't actually exist in that 18-year gap. But I mean, for Mary, there's no more wine at my friend's banquet. Let me ask Jesus. He'll sort it out. Some things happened in that time period that's caused her faith to rise to the point where she goes, hey, I'll just ask him and he'll fix it. And Jesus' response in verse 4 is this. He says, woman... Why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. He's like, shh, mom. Don't tell everyone. My hour hasn't come yet. By the way, calling your mom or your wife woman is not something I recommend if you value your life, right? <laughs> you need to respect your wife or your mom. It's like when Mish asked me to put tomato sauce on the shopping list. Which, I mean, I did. I obeyed and I put it on the shopping list. I couldn't read the shopping list after that. <laughs> You'll catch it eventually. Yeah. But I did check on the culture at the time. And actually, this word woman was a term of endearment. So we take it as your. That's a little bit disrespectful, like the way Jesus responded to his mom, woman. No, it was actually a term of endearment in the time. Um, and... He says, my time has not yet come. Clearly, him and Mary have perhaps had some discussions along the way about what he feels led to do and what God's put on his heart and what he's called to this earth to do and how it's becoming real to him. And he's saying, mom, I know we've chatted about this, but my time to do all of this has not yet come. He knew that if he displayed his power here in public in this moment, there would be no turning back but something must have settled in that moment between him saying that in his heart or in his spirit or the father saying it's okay son the time is now because both for him and for Mary it doesn't record a little side argument it doesn't record another discussion it doesn't record anything of that nature the next thing we read is simply one line from Mary and it's maybe one of the greatest instructions of all time, and it's one that you and I can learn a lot from today, actually. She turns to the servants, and she simply says, do whatever he tells you to do. And again, we skip over that quite quickly. <laughs> I do, anyway. And this, when I'm sitting and I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, what has Mary experienced that she would say something like that to the servants? Just do whatever he tells you to do. What crazy things has she experienced? What wacky moments have happened up until that point that she would respond in that way to the servants? Like, walk around the walled fortress of Jericho seven times and then blow your trumpets and these walls that no one has ever been able to break through are going to come crashing down. Or Go down to the river and wash the mud that I've created with my spit in the ground off your eyes and then you'll be able to see. She's experienced some stuff that would cause her to turn to the servants and say, guys, this is going to be weird. Some strange stuff is probably going to happen, but just hear me out. Just do whatever he tells you to do. What is Jesus telling you and I? to do today? What is he instructing us to involve ourselves in? Does it seem maybe strange? Does it seem silly? Does it seem uncomfortable? Does it seem against the norm? Does it seem like the thing that others maybe wouldn't choose in that situation? Often that's 
Jesus speaking. Next scripture, verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each of them holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And most of us go, ach, sweet, and then we carry on reading. But after taking it all in slowly, how big was this banquet? 20 gallons. They were 20 to 30 gallons. 20 gallons is 75 liters of fluid. A wine bottle by today's standards. This is not a wine bottle. This is a grape juice bottle. It's kind of that big, right? This one's a bit bigger. It holds just over a liter. A normal wine bottle that you probably are familiar with is 750 mils. One of the jars, there's six, one of the jars holds between 20 and 30 gallons. Between 100 and 150 of today's wine bottles. Remember, Jesus is organizing for the family the backup wine. He's not catering for the whole function here. They've had some wine. They've run out of wine. Now we're organizing the backup wine. Fill the six stone water jars of each between 20 and 30 gallons to the brim. Fill them. This is what it looks like depicted. Bottle on the far left, 750 mils. The picture in the middle, 100 wine bottles. If you take it to the extreme, 30 gallons looks something like the backup wine, 900 bottles, between 600 and 900 bottles as the backup wine for the celebration in Cana of Galilee that we saw is this small hamlet somewhere. How many of you know when you take your problems to Jesus, he doesn't just solve them, but he solves them in abundance. He solves them in abundance. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. They were not ordinary jars. These were washing pots. They were used to keep the Jews from being spiritually impure before they participated in the feast. So we forget the significance of this particular moment. And thank you, Anna, for the, for the reminder. Uh, when I mentioned the scripture a week or two back, Anna, you know, reminded me of the fact that this was a ceremonial Jewish law washing moment. So he's asking the servants to top up the water that's used for religious cleansing, which would allow them to be outwardly clean before they participate in the meal. That's really what Jesus is asking to do that. So he's going to turn this water of the law into wine. You can put that next picture up, Leo. Maybe a reminder right at the beginning from his first miracle, the wine that would later become a symbol of his blood that cleanses us, not outwardly before we have a chow, but washes us clean of all sin, replacing, as we know, the requirements of the law with the freedom in Jesus of being free from sin. And he's kind of saying to the lawmakers and the religious people of that time already through his first miracle, this is not going to be your way. This is going to be my way. And it's a very different way. Think of the poor servants walking backwards and forwards. They weren't carrying 75 to 112 liters of fluid. They were going to the well with a bucket, fetching, coming back, pouring, topping them up with water. And they're probably thinking, we're getting ready to wash again. I mean, we've asked him to sort out the wine, and now we're topping off the washing liquid. But whatever he says, do, do. Whatever he says, do, do. Whatever he says, do. Mary's words, maybe. They're probably grumbling a bit. They're probably thinking it's crazy. 
Well, things are about to get just a little more weird because you see then Jesus said in verse 8, draw some of it out and take it to the head waiter or the master of the banquet. And when checking this out, this was an important role in the day. He was the MC. He was running the show. He was in a serious position. It was actually a professional calling at the time. He had to taste everything and check the presentation of everything, like that chef standing on the pass, double-checking everything before it goes out, and ensuring that the quality was good enough of both the food and the drink. Personally, I'm going to complain to management or whoever changed this law from those times because I've emceed I don't know how many weddings in the last two decades, Anna's laughing already. Not once have I ever been called upon to taste the food or the drink or anything like that before the Philistines, I mean the invited guests, go to the tables and actually literally demonstrate the moving of mountains. Usually as the MC, you're kind of left with whatever's left at the end of it, right? But yeah, if any of you are having a family function, I volunteer my services as a professional taster. But bottom line is this, this guy, he knows his stuff. He's not an amateur. He's, he's, he does this for a living, and he makes sure an event like this happens well, that the food is well presented, the wine is good enough, etc., etc. So I can only imagine the servants must be shaking his head, you know, slowly dipping in, getting some of this liquid and taking it to the head waiter, you know, Mr. Super Refined Taste Buds Professional Calling Taster. And he's probably thinking, that, you know, the washing water wine is not going to go down that well. Uh, whatever he says, do, do it. Matt, can you come help me here, right? Not with your medicine, but just pour some water there. Uh, yeah, into one of the cups, but and you can pour some wine as well, cleverly disguised as grape tizer, um, into another one of them. So I don't know exactly when this happened. Um, could have happened in the pots already by the time they were ladling them off. It could have happened that they were still ladling off water into the cups. I mean, we don't know exactly when it happened, but at some point when the servant, Matt, is carrying the ceremonially clean Valpre water. Yeah, you can carry them both to a taster, Matt. Choose a taster, any taster. Yeah, but somewhere between the water being dished and the tasting <laughs> happening Jackie is now the official head taster, and Jackie's going to taste the wine. Jackie, Matt, you can take the water away, bud. In fact, I'll have the water. Thanks, boy. Jackie, taste the wine for us. Tell us if it tastes good or not. Mm. Thumbs up. Thumbs up from Jackie. It's an amazing moment, right? I mean, we, we laugh about it now, doing some water and wine. But at some point, between the water being topped off in those clay jars and it arriving on the lips of the head waiter, thank you, Matt, for your help, um, things have changed. The molecules in that liquid have been altered. The color has changed. The taste certainly has changed. The temperature is perfect. And slowly he or she <laughs> tastes the wine and, oh my word, is blown away by the flavor of the wine. Now, we're in John chapter 2. If you go just one chapter back for homework, you can read it, the beginning of John chapter 1, all the way back to Genesis. You'll remember John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and all things that were created were created, special celebration in the front row, through Him, through Him. 
So actually, when you think about it, changing a few molecules of liquid from one form to another between them being, I don't know, dished and tasted and whenever it happened, this is a small thing. This is Jesus who was the word. He was there in the beginning. Through him, all things were created. By the way, the planets and things were hung in the sky in the dark. Read Genesis chapter 1. The light came next. He formed all of this stuff before we could even see it or perceive it. So to change a few molecules of liquid, hey, this was small for Jesus, but in the context of this wedding feast, wow. The head waiter goes up to the groom of the ceremony. Now, we don't even know if the groom was aware that there was a problem. Maybe he was like the groom at the wedding I was at. He didn't even know what the problem was or why there was a problem. But I don't know, maybe he knew about it. Maybe he didn't. Maybe Mary had kept him from it. But perhaps the groom knew and he saw this head waiter walking towards him with a cup. And he must be maybe, you know, a little bit of dread in him or whatever with the shocked expression on the head waiter's face and Verse 9b, going into verse 10 there, Leel. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you, oh man, you, you're good, man. In all my years, oh, wow, I've never seen this done before. You have saved the best until last. I'm pretty sure this is not what they actually look like but it's two Jewish guys that it looks like of some kind of celebration and they look pretty chuffed with each other at the at the outcome so I figured it would fit right so the confused response of the groom is not recorded in scriptures but what you clearly can tell from what the word tells us here is that zero embarrassment which was Mary's concern zero embarrassment was felt by the family because of the wine crisis in fact, Jesus has taken it from a situation where there could have been great embarrassment to a situation where the head waiter is congratulating the groom for the most wonderful outcome that he's ever experienced at a feast like this. And the final word on this matter simply records forever what has transpired in this moment and what it meant in verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the first sign. What's a sign? You can put up the next one there, Leal. Well, a sign tells us something, right? It announces something. It confirms something. It provides a direction. It provides confirmation. This is a sign, a confirmation, an indication, a direction. It's a sign. It's the first sign through which Jesus revealed his glory. That's recorded there in verse 11. And it caused his disciples, by the way, to believe in him. That's a telling verse. Not just because it's his first sign or his first miracle, but I can see Mary sitting there with a smile on her face kind of nodding in their direction and the disciples looking going wow this is what just happened to each other and mom's like told you guys right she knew she knew she must have known when she reached out to Jesus in that moment he's capable of this she knew when she told the servants do whatever he says he's capable of this and the disciples saw and experienced for their own selves, for the first time in this physical world, a miracle. This was Jesus' first miracle. Beautiful, right? A simple story for us this morning. A life-saving, health-restoring, forever-securing miracle, right? No, not really, Mike. Actually, it wasn't any of these things wasn't really life-saving. No one's health was restored unless they were desperately in need of some good wine. I don't know. No one was transformed forever through what we see here. It was a wedding. It wasn't a life-threatening situation. No one was going to die. 
it was simply a situation that would have caused embarrassment. Wow, what a crisis. For Jesus' mom's friends. What's the message in that? For me, it's that Jesus cares about every detail of our lives. He cares about every detail of our lives. He doesn't just want us to throw the big decisions and the big concerns and the big anxieties his way. He wants to help with everything. He's chosen this moment to reveal to the world who he is. Someone's going to be embarrassed at a wedding feast. That's telling. Quite simply, all he requires of you and me is to trust him. Do you trust him today? With the big things, with the little things, with the stuff that's maybe going to cause you some embarrassment or anguish or pain, Jesus cares. That's the message for me in this. Will you hand it over to him? You see, God is maintaining the entire universe and everything in it through his word. Jesus, will you hand it over to him this morning? If you think about it, actually this life that we're living is a miracle. It was spoken and bam, it happened. Jesus spoke and there was light. Jesus did this miracle in the town of Cana in Galilee, in obscurity, at the wedding of an unknown or unnamed man and woman. I love the fact that he doesn't choose you know, this massively opulent, I don't know, town square at the center of Jerusalem. I love the fact, by the way, that he chose to use what they already had. He didn't use anything that wasn't already there at the wedding feast. He doesn't require of you and I something that we don't already have in order to demonstrate his miraculous power in our lives. Dirty clay pots used for ceremonial washing, and water from the well. Not palace gold and fine silver and goblets. His message for me in this is that he came for you. He came for me. And he cares about us. And all he requires is exactly what we have to give him. What's already available. Wow. Three big takeaways for me this morning from this, and we've prayed into some of it, so it's amazing how from the prayer meeting this morning through the time of worship and the sharing of the word now, Jesus is speaking to us. First thing is that we are called to missions. Don't know if you know that this morning, but Jesus has called us as his servants onto the mission field. We go into all the world, right? Right? We go, he does the rest. So miracles of life-saving transformation are up to Jesus and the Spirit. We don't do that, but we are called to go into all the world. Will we do what Jesus has asked us to do? Not transform lives, he does that. But will we carry the water like the servants did and fill up those jars or whatever it is that seems quite menial in an obscure place with unnamed people that doesn't seem to be center stage, that most people might look at and say, hey, this is not big stuff that you're busy with. You're carrying chairs. You're making coffee. You're walking around in the community. You're interacting with a few people at work. As we carry his word with us, he will transform lives if we will go with him. And as Mary asked the servants, do whatever he says. That's what he requires of us. It's not the big flashy things for me that he's asking of us. It's the regular, ordinary, relational stuff. Jackie, there are people that you can reach that I will never reach. And there's a bunch of people that Craig interacts with that you and I 
will never meet. He's called us and placed us wherever he's placed us, in communities, varsity, schools, workplaces, neighborhoods, to be his hands and feet and simply to go. It's coffee. It's dinner. It's a phone call. It's a text message. It's simply being his hands and feet and making a difference as we carry his word with us into the community. Jesus is there with you in those conversations if you'll allow him. Amen? And finally, and importantly for you this morning, when we face difficult circumstances, like I'm sure many of you in this room and online are maybe facing right now, do we give them to Jesus? I battle with this one, right? Do we give them to Jesus? Or do we whine and complain and declare death and speak negatively about the reality that we're facing and the outcomes that are likely to happen? Do we share that negativity with anyone who will listen and build our little army of complainers with us as we all moan together about what we're all having to face in this terrible country or economy or situation or state of health or whatever it is? Or do we hand them over to Jesus and trust Trust, there's something in that. Trust that he's really and truly got it. He's won the battle. He doesn't have to win the battle. He's won the battle. He's got this. Or maybe like me, from time to time, you try to help him. The creator of the universe. We're going to help him solve the problem. Mary is such a wonderful example for me in this very scripture. Why? She took her burden to Jesus in one sentence, and she went back to the party. There's no record of her trying to help. There's no record of her saying, oh, Jesus, let me see if there's some clean jars that we can rather serve the... No, she's left it with him, told the servants, he's going to ask you to do some weird stuff, just do what he says, and she's gone back to her mates, that's it. What an example for you and I, her message is clear, hand your battles over to God, that situation, no matter how big or small it is this morning, hand it over to God, and go back to the party. It's easy to talk about, right? And then we're going to step into this week and we're going to be asked to live it out. I think we sometimes find it irresponsible to hand it over to God. It's like there's some kind of weight of responsibility in carrying this thing with me. I read in my devotions this week that it's not irresponsible to hand our burdens over to God. In fact, if you think about it, it's irresponsible not to. Because you can't, and I can't, and yet we try to hang on to our little bit of the weight to carry. So can I encourage you this morning, as I encourage myself, every one of you, make a decision today to disown your battles and ask Jesus to own them. Give ownership of the battle to God. That's what I wrote here. And watch what he will do. 600 to 900 bottles of wine to cater for the top-up wine at the ceremony that tasted the best. I don't know how many people were there. If there were 600 people there, that sounds like a lot of people, they each walked away with a bottle of top-up. He will abundantly supply when you hand over and go back to the party. Final scripture this morning, John 14. Whatever you ask for in my name, I will do it for you. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, thank you just so much for the truth of your word, Lord, revealed to us in the scriptures, just so simply, Lord, as it always is, and yet we try to complicate things often, Lord Jesus. For me, just a reminder this morning, Lord, for every one of us, of what you've called us to as your servants, Lord. We are on a mission with you, Jesus. As we prayed this morning, 
at the pre-service prayer meeting, Lord, you build, Lord. We labor in vain if we try to do it. Your house first, Lord. We want to build with you. You taught us how to pray, Jesus, to our Father in heaven. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see your kingdom come, Lord Jesus. We want to be part of your bride, the church, as your kingdom is being built, Lord. We are on mission with you. We hear your call this morning as those servants did walking backwards and forwards with buckets of liquid, Lord, that you were going to transform into the most beautiful wine to save this family from embarrassment. We want to be like those servants, Lord, just doing what you've called us to do. And not with anything fancy, but with what you've already put in our hands, Lord. Thank you for that reminder this morning. We recommit ourselves to your mission first, Lord Jesus. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Thank you that we get to live that out every day in our homes, communities, families, workplaces, schools, varsities, wherever you put us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that reminder. And then, Lord, I just lift up before you every home and every family that's connected with us online or that's represented here in the building today, Lord, or those that will still watch this at some later stage. Lord, I lift everyone up before you that's facing situations or a situation, no matter how small they may be thought it was, that it wasn't worth troubling you with, like an embarrassing situation, no matter how big it seems to be, Lord, like a mountain that just cannot be moved, like a storm, and we spoke about that in our worship time, Lord, that Jesus, you're able to calm just with a single word on the boat as you were with your disciples, altering just like you did the wine, the water, sorry, into wine, Lord, altering the, the weather that day to make the lake calm when everyone thought they were going to drown. Maybe there's homes and people and families and individuals and your children here today who feel like, oh my word, I can't handle one more wave. I can't handle one more breath of this hurricane wind. I'm in the storm, Lord. I don't know what to do. It's going to capsize me. I'm going to drown. There's no hope. Father, that they would hand that battle over to you this morning, that each one of us, Lord, would hand the battle to you, Lord, disown it, leave you to own it, not try to help, not get in the way, Lord, but trust as you've asked us, trust, Lord, and we ask, Lord, in your name, just as your, your word is declared here in John 14 at the end, Lord, we ask in your name, Lord, and your promises, Lord Jesus, as we call on your name, that you will do it, Lord, whatever we ask in your name that you will do it. And so, Lord, right now, I speak your peace over everyone, Lord, that's receiving this prayer as their own, Lord, in the situations they're facing, Lord. I speak your peace, Lord, as we declare these things done right now with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Thank you, Lord, for miracle healing, miracle provision, miracle restoration, Lord, your future that you've got for each one, Lord, your kingdom being built and us celebrating with you. We, we pray with thanksgiving this morning and declare the peace of God that protects and guards every heart and every mind this morning in Christ Jesus to be evident as we step into this week and what you've got for us. In Jesus' name, we pray as you've commanded us. And everyone said, Amen. 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 We definitely have cappuccinos, Marcel. I saw the beans. Minimum, we have cappuccinos. I'm sure we've got hot chocolate as well. Um, and looking forward to a sunrise meeting and chops and slops um, next week. Yeah, so have a great week and appreciate you all. Cheers.